order. And Abby, will, will you go ahead and do a roll call? Amber. Amber, I'm sorry. I apologize. Candy Cook. Bill Stedham. Here. Mike Crowley. Here. Rick Albers. Kara Bang. Here. Julie Jackson. Here. Cassie Lopp. Candy Linson. Here. Ruben Pena. Here. Charles Cordor. Byron Underwood. Here. Clea Youngblood. Here. All right. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, I'm obviously not Candy, but she couldn't be here today. So therefore, I don't have many remarks, like none. So <laughs> other, other than that, we had a great subcommittee to work on some things between the last meeting, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And Vanessa, did you want to provide some housekeeping rules? Always. Um, so we have a lot of folks virtual today. Uh, so just as a reminder, um, if you are on the committee, we like you to have your camera on and um, you can mute yourself. Usually helps if you're muted, um, but feel free as a member to speak up whenever you have the raise hand that looks like a hand or a smiley face with a hand that keeps changing on me. Um, and then don't forget to unraise it, to push that button to put it down or else we'll call on you later when we see it and you'll be like, oh, no, I left it up. Um, and then in this room, I think we can hear pretty well. Um, you don't have to yell, but you don't want to whisper. Um, so just, just speak regularly. We don't really have anything at the table, so we should be all right. Um, and then as an aside, this thing will pick up your secret conversations. We've all seen it happen. Um, so don't have secret conversations generally, but also that thing will pick it up and it will be forever recorded. <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, we don't have minutes to approve because the they're working on the website to comply with some of the new state requirements. So those will be coming forward as I understand it. And as far as public or written comments received on non-agenda items, Vanessa, when I looked at those, I wasn't sure that both of those comments, I think, apply to agenda items. But do you have any other comments that we haven't seen yet? I think uh, there was a supplement for five for agenda item five, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, so there is. That is the one from um, Benjamin something. Stroop. Ben Stroop. Stroop. Or Stroop. I don't know. Um, so we do have those. So if you guys, as a reminder for um, comments that are on non-agenda items, um, it's not for a deep dive. It's really just a, a high level discussion of, is this something that you want to put on the agenda for next time? Is this something you think isn't something you want on the agenda? Is it already resolved? Is it something that we do need to look at? Things like that. All right. So as I understand it, Ben's comments as reading through it are in reference to that he wants a qualifier to be put on mortgage lending. Uh, and his specific recommendation as a provider shall be shall require specialized training or work experience for instructors teaching specialized subjects such as law, appraisal, investments, taxation, home inspection, and he wants to add or mortgage financing. And you can all see his comments there. Is this something we should add to the agenda for next time or not? And I'll just listen to what people have said. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I was reading this also, but you know, uh, and I can appreciate his comments, but where do we kind of put a stop to uh, adding more and more people? I mean, we have people in the escrow business. Uh, we discussed that in, in the training. Um, now we have a specialty in uh, people who do mobile notaries for uh, title companies for uh, real estate closings and who now who else knows what goes on and you know somebody with ai is going to be doing different things so i just kind of worry wonder where do we stop it at uh, or do we just keep adding to the list of wanting to get more people special specialized in there i, I don't see an attorney uh, coming in and teaching you know, whatever hours it is of 
of uh, real estate law or um, or um, any of the other specialties that that was mentioned here. Thank you. OK. You're welcome. Any other comments? Mr. Chair, I, I'm I mayor, call. Mr. Chairman, it's Kalea. Go ahead. I'm mayor, uh, I'm mayor Ruben's concern. I think that it's a bit um, like where does it end with regard to specialty courses and that the provider should use the discernment, which is per the TREC rule, to ensure that the instructor is qualified on those types of specialty courses. Also, just specific to mortgage lending, um, you know, there are rules with regards to someone who is not licensed, um, you know, talking about lending and, and mortgage and rates and all of those things. And so um, that would be a concern anyway, just having an instructor that's really not as well versed in mortgage lending or it's not licensed, a, a licensed loan originator or mortgage broker. So I, I tend to agree with Mr. Pena about you know, it's a slippery slope with regards to the, the niche courses that we offer. Okay. Other comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mike Crowley. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on Ruben and Kalea. Um, understanding there is a specific uh, mortgage loan originator license uh, that's only applicable to certain types of loan originators. Um, and so it would create very complex situation. Uh, somebody, for example, who uh, originates loans for credit unions doesn't require the same license as somebody does it for the banking industry, so on and so forth. And to put this in, into place, I think as Kalei had mentioned, uh, the commission already requires that the provider ensure that the instructor is qualified in that subject matter. And so the onus would come on them if for some reason it's called into question. All right. Other comments? Hearing, hearing none, then Vanessa, I believe what we do is vote whether to put it on the agenda or not. Is that correct? Only if you want to put it on the agenda. If you just want is to leave there. OK. Is there anyone that would make a motion to put this on the agenda? Hearing none, we're going to move the item to agenda item number six, which is staff report on enforcement agent uh, matters. And Marcy Cotton, would you report on that, please? Uh, this is Mike Malloy, Director of Enforcement. Uh, I'll be reporting today. Okay. Uh, one case that was on the report uh, dealt with a you know, provider. Their course expired and they provided the the course to students uh, that had previously been disciplined. Uh, so there was another agreed order reflecting uh, this more, uh, more recent violation. That's the conclusion. Okay. Case. Any questions by anybody? You'll see in this report, it reflects the link that we discussed like seems like a forever ago um, so that's available to click and view the actual agreed order uh, for these cases all right are there any questions by anybody on the committee Okay, hearing none, we'll move to agenda item number seven, which is discussion and possible action regarding the signature requirements under the 22 TAC, and you can read the subparagraph there, responsibilities and operations of providers by qualifying courses. And Jen, you're gonna provide the introduction, correct? Yes. <clears throat> um, but the introduction is, is fairly brief. If you recall, this was originally brought to the attention of ESAC by um, John Hauser of Texas Realtors, and he requested consideration um, by the committee to make a recommendation for an exemption for trade associations to require the signature of the education provider on the enrollment agreement. Um, that, from staff perspective, I don't have any real issue with that, but I would propose not 
limiting it to trade associations, but making that um, across the board. I think a digital signature or stamp on behalf of the education provider is what the discussion had, had kind of leaned itself into. And from the education standpoint, I have no objection to that. Um, the key, I think, is getting the acknowledgement from the student, and that requirement would remain in place, and that's that the student has read and acknowledged all of the components of the enrollment agreement for their courses. But it would be all a right. Digital yes, digital Already signature. Part of the provider. Yes, a digital or stamp signature on part of the provider, and then you know, but as such, also digital signatures are accepted on on the part of the students as well. Right. I was just making sure that we're, we've still got two. Yes, yes. But I think what Mr. Hauser presented was a difficulty in, you know, just kind of more of a pen and ink independent signature on behalf of the operations manager of the education provider for every enrollment agreement. And I think we can agree that that's, you know, the provider knows what's on the enrollment agreement. <laughs> All right. Discussion amongst the committee. Uh, I I agree with the analysis that if we're going to do this, we ought to do it across the board, not just for uh, trade associations. It it makes sense to do it across the board, and doing digital signatures is not the wave of the future anymore. It's the wave of the present. All right. I can wholeheartedly agree with that um, as a as a provider. Um, the, the gist of the enrollment agreement is to ensure that the student knows and understands what the refund policies are, what the attendance policies are, you know, just the, the housekeeping and rules and regs of the course. And an acknowledgement is is plenty. And that's in line with what you see in any other type of purchase, you know, in today's day and age. And so. Um, I agree with making it just across the board um, as somebody who, who runs a trade association. I'm indifferent on that. I think, though, it's the, the whole digital wet signature on behalf of both the provider and the student is just overkill when the website is in compliance with rules and regulations for the course. The student receives a receipt with all of those things. It's, you know, it, it's just unnecessary at this time. So I would definitely concur with Mr. Albers that this is needed, a needed change. All right. Other discussion? Mr. Chair, Mike Crowley. Yes, sir. Um, in in uh, concert with the other comments you've received, um, the if the language were to read something similar to a pre-enrollment agreement must be acknowledged um, by the student prior to commencement of the course, uh, something along those lines, I think would be better. Uh, students having different technology, even a, a actual digital signature, I think is asking a bit much, so much as uh, any form of acknowledgement that they've received the policies and agreed to them, uh, I think would suffice and would be universal across the board. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments from the committee or anybody else? All right, I presume we need a motion to move forward on this. Is that correct? Well, no, if you're not making uh, that exception or changing anything right now, it's a it's a signature. We're all agreeing digital works, um, you know, Perhaps there's some notice that goes out in our newsletter to providers we can cover, but there wouldn't be a rule change or the, if you leave it, right, if we go this direction. All right. Does anybody not want to go this direction? Well, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, it was the comment was made once or twice about making it universal. Uh, would we want to make a change to that now uh, through a motion or just leave it alone? It is. Well, yeah, if we don't. Is. Yeah, I, I, I think it is universal okay. if, if we make it clear that a signature means what a signature means under the all of the electronic acts that allow for digital signatures. Okay. 
I'm good. Thank okay. You. All right. Hearing no need to make any changes there, we're going to move on to one that will probably get more discussion. And that's agenda item number eight, discussion and possible action regarding revisions to principles one and two, course approval forms. And Jen, do you want to provide the in introduction on that? I think this is going Mr. to tie Mr. into Chair? agenda item nine also. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Ken, uh, maybe on the last one, maybe we should instruct staff to uh, put out a clarification as to what signature means under that rule. We'll do that. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. I think that's good enough. Okay. Perfect. All right. Now, Jen, provide an introduction on agenda item number eight, if you would, please. Sure, and I'll probably defer to the committee really who uh, did the work on this, but um, based on the discussion at the last ESAC meeting, um, you were looking at revisions to the principles one and two course approval forms. A uh, working group was put together that provided some materials, uh, revisions that are included in your materials today. Um, and I think that's I think those working group members might be best to kind of provide a direction or their perspective on how they came to those recommendations. Outstanding. And also, while we may have two different actions, I think the discussion is going to be on agenda item number eight and uh, number nine at the same time, uh, because both were discussed by that working group and agenda item number nine's discussion and possible action regarding requiring principles one and two courses as a prerequisite to other qualifying courses. So with that being said, I'll open it up to discussion. Who would like to start that? Preferably somebody from the working group, but it can be anybody. As silence goes, undergoes. Well, Mr. Underwood, why don't you go ahead? Oh, thank you so much, <laughs> Mr. Jacobus, for that. Um, we, as the, the, the working group we we sent several emails back and forth to determine when we would meet and in the meantime each of us put together um at least an outline as to what uh the the two courses or one course if we put it together as one course what that would look like and uh once we shared all that information uh with each other and reviewed it then we were able to come to a consensus that um, uh, and if I'm if I make mistakes as I'm going through here, please please jump in and fix it. Um, that uh, they would remain two courses, principles one and principles two. Uh, we would recommend would remain as two separate courses, without a specific without a specific um, order as to the uh, the chapters that were in each of those courses. Uh, but we did want to make a, a recommendation that uh, the principles one and two course be uh, prerequisite to the other qualifying qualifying uh, courses um, um, and and making some changes also to uh, some of the material, which included um, uh, the math. Um, for the most part, I think that's where we we limited or at least talked about limiting some of the uh, the, the the topics of the math that are uh, in the uh, principles two course now. Um, anyone anybody want to uh, further detail or add to that? I'll also say I think it makes sense to tackle eight first, which is this, okay. and, yeah. then and, then and then and then tackle that. I mean, I I I know you put it in the summary, but I'd say that we also do have a comment to consider under item eight, a public comment. Okay. But other than that, I will shut up. No, I appreciate that. So I, I would like to ask the clarifying question. Oh, sure. I, I was reading through, um, and I know one of the questions that, that comes up regularly for the course <clears> that <throat> exists now is the order of the topics. Right. And so um, for our purposes and the way the rule is written, the topics <clears throat> are essentially the, the chapter titles. Right. So... Is that what your your recommendation is? Is still that the units or the subtopics stay within the topic, but the topics can be rearranged, or that everything, every line item, can be arranged? That within the within the topics, the topics can be moved 
um, uh, by the instructor uh, in order to, um, I think the words that we used was to unravel or to, to uh, show the story of those particular courses. Um, okay. We, because we all tend to present them a little bit differently and give the instructor that leeway, the content all staying the same okay. within the topics. But That's the, helpful. So for example, and this is just a random example, if an instructor wanted to start the course with real property and then move to introduction, they could do that. They could do that. Okay. Just I, I wanted have, to make sure everybody also was have clear the on that because to do that. we talked about it a lot. Right. We Thank did you. talk about that a lot. Yeah. Uh, but helpful. within the, the topics themselves, leaving the particular um, content bullets are okay. in there. Um, the okay. way they are now in Thank this you. recommendation. Other comments from the room on this? We can. Do you want to read Byron, them you said that the committee's recommendation was to keep one and two separate. Not yes, to combine them. Not to right. put them okay. together into one 60 okay. hours of, of hours. principles of real estate. Hold on. Oh, can you say that again? Yeah, sorry. Um, to leave principles one and principles two as separate courses instead of uh, putting them together into one course. All right. So I'm confused because if I look at bullet item number three, it says we suggest changing the format to a 60 hour required course before taking advanced or specialized. Then I'm mistaken. That's my fault, Bill. So thank no you. No problem. Direction. I definitely agree that we should keep it as two separate courses. Um, it just feels a little much to combine them. Um, and with respect to the subcommittee, thank you so much for putting all this together and being so thoughtful with regards to the order of the of the content. I agree with those changes, but I do think that it's just a bit much to combine them. Um, just thinking through all that's required with, with regards to pre-licensing, um, that would be my two cents. I think the okay. order of the topics in that adjustment is great. All right. Other comments from the committee? Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, my understanding is that the topics do not necessarily have to be in the order that they're listed here, that it's up to the um, instructor's discretion. And if that's the case, are we going to require one before two? Principles one before principles two? Well, that's a good question. And, and we had originally recommended combining them, but we can certainly discuss and hash that apart. Um, I saw a hand raised. I think it's Kalia. No, it's Mike. I'm sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, yes, getting back to the combining into one sixty hour. Um, it's uh, I'm actually a proponent of that uh, of the recommendation to do that. It's not something that's not already done in in real estate inspection. Um, it's not something that's not already done in mortgage loan origination and other like courses to have that prerequisite that it's the total combined general information course and then followed by the other ones. Um, I think that in the long run would be better for the student and the consumer to be able to go through all the detail or sorry, the uh, the high level of everything before moving on. And if you were to have it be two courses and it'd be a prerequisite, it's going to cause confusion more so for the consumer looking to take courses. So in, in the uh, idea of making it easier for the students, having that one 60 hour course to get them started, understand the basics and then move on. And the same thing for for licensing, you know, that that should be the first one they've done. You just have to worry about recording the one versus recording those two in a particular order. So that's what I have to say about it. Okay, good <coughs> comment. Mr. Yeah. Jacobus, did you have a comment? Can I just make a comment from the classroom? 
<clears throat> yes, sir. If, if you make this 60 hour prerequisite course, prerequisite courses are standard in almost every industry. And the, to try to say that you teach principles one because it's a basis for principles two, it's not. That's not the truth. They're, they're different topics altogether, and they're all substantive topics. And in my P brain, uh, having all the topics put together into one prerequisite course prepares the student for the next one. If you try to teach a finance course, and the student has this staring glaze at you wanting to know what fee simple means. Uh, it's, it's tough to explain that without going back into very basic curricula again. And having taught a whole lot of advanced courses, <clears throat> the prerequisite to me just makes sense as a teacher that I can keep going back to basics. And if you look at the way we organize the course this time, um, and I think the committee did a real good job piecing these things together. If you go right down the list here, you will see that almost every topic is based on a prior topic. And so you go to the next topic and gosh, to discuss real estate appraisal, we now have to go back and talk about fundamentals of real estate, which we've already covered, I hope, by the time we get there. And control of land use and the Real Estate License Act, which we, we've saved almost until the end, because I think that's the best time to set the hook. Um, trying to make this two 30-hour courses indicates that one is better than the other, or one is a prerequisite to the other. And I think that confuses the issue. A prerequisite is a fundamental course. And once we have that behind us, we can use that as the building block for the more advanced courses. Okay, thank you. Other comments? That's sure. well said. Sure. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, earlier, there was a comment from uh, uh, Ben Strube in reference to uh, the specialties. And one of the comments he made on bullet number six, he says, and he talked about the, the current issue dealing with the grades of people passing and not passing. He made a comment and said this that this would certainly help improve the test scores. Uh, you know, I'm just going to make this comment in reference to that. I don't know that that's going to automatically help improve test scores, but you know, we're all in such a hurry. And I say we all, meaning people taking courses, to hurry up and get their real estate license. And they leave there and they go take their test and they don't pass it or whatever. But there's not a whole lot of emphasis in spending more time on the critical parts of what they need to learn. And principles one and two are 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 just that. I mean, those are the principles of real estate. And and without doing such of a of an opportunity to make sure they're taking these courses and learning uh, more all at one time, if you will. Uh, may maybe that will help increase the 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 past scores. I don't I don't know, but I do know this. In dealing with real estate agents on a daily basis, I wish that the majority of them would go back and take a principal's course, um, one, two, and three, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sorry, but it's it's just it it's the way it is. They're in such a hurry to get their license, and no one else wants to get their license. Is sitting down and teaching them, but this allows an opportunity to spend more time on on such an important subject of what's happening, of what they're going to end up using more than anything else, I think, being licensed for 45 years now, more than anything else. Those are the, I think, the two of the most important parts of going to real estate school and passing your exam. I think we should honor this the way we mentioned it and the way we brought it up. Mr. Jacobus, myself, and your and, um, and chairman, and, and also uh, there was two other members to our group. I apologize, um, uh, but I think it's important that we we take this to really, really strong consideration. If I took a course today and I, and the only course that was available was finance, I'd be totally lost. Don't know anything about it. And then the next course is principles too. 
I take principles too. I'm again, I'm lost because I didn't take one. I, I need the basics to lead me on to the next step. And I think this is going to help um, work, help people get their license and maybe increase their passing scores on their, on their exams. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And That's by right. the way, I agree with your comments. I agree with all the comments that I've heard so far. Kalia. Oh, she's muted. You're muted. Sorry, I'm still bad at it. Um, I have a question for um, Vanessa, please. With regards to barrier to entry, would any of these um, changes potentially um, trigger up what our governor said, or are there any concerns there with regards to increasing barrier to entry? I don't know. I mean, not that. I mean, not the change to the course outline. Um, but this conversation about the prerequisites, um, well, I think the conversation about a true prerequisite is actually a bigger conversation. Um, the 60 hour course, probably not, but that's one of those ones. I think any of the recommendations that come out today, like we've contemplated different routes, but any of the recommendations that you all make today, we're going to have to take back and see, okay, how would this truly work within our frameworks, things like, you know, the regulatory compliance division. Also, honestly, our system, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're in this weird place where um, we're on the, the edge of getting a new system, but we don't know, you know, some of the limitations we've seen on this stuff has been due to our own database, but um, I can't tell you that the new database can do this thing. I love saying that it can. Mm -hmm. um, so, all of that is to say, I don't know the answer to that. And some of the things they pick up on in terms of what would be a barrier to entry are, are not what I would have originally contemplated and vice versa, some of the things that I think would have been. So it's a little bit of a wild card. All of that is to say, I think if you, if this group comes to us with some, or you know, votes and makes some formal recommendations today, then we can take those recommendations and try and plug them in to the framework that we have get, give you the pros and the cons. Um, I know that's not a real answer to your question because I don't know the answer to your question. Um, but I think there's, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of potential for that to be implicated, but you know, you never know actually. Thank you. I have a quick follow up question for everyone. And that is, if this is the route we go, would your professional recommendation also be to look at the remainder of the courses? And, and do you find that there needs to be some order for the other courses? Or is it really just having a prerequisite that is necessary? So, for example, if we said, you know, principles one and two need to be first and foremost, is next finance, is next law, is, you know, are you thinking that there should be a uh, entire order of the courses, or is it really just about principles one and two? We didn't talk about in the working group, we did not discuss the order of the other courses. We felt strongly that there needs to be a strong foundation before we get into the other courses, because otherwise they're at a loss when it happens. So we did, we definitely did not talk about the rest of the order. Uh, we just talked about principles one and two. Thank you. Rick? Uh, I will sh sh lower my hand. Uh, I think it's just principles one and two. Uh, there needs to be a, a basis, some a foundation for everybody. And I think principle one and two gets you there. And I think the rest of the order doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. Um, I think uh, I'm the one thing that's still in my mind is that 60 hours is an awfully long course and it I, i'd like to know if if everybody thinks that 60 hours is okay or is it better to have it as two separate hunks so that people can bite it off not have to take such a big bite and not have to take such a big chunk out of their time to go take a 60 hour course straight through you know if you could take 30 hours and then take a breather be it for a week or six months and then take the other half of it. Um, that would seem to be less of a barrier to entry maybe. Um, and I normally don't don't advocate for making it easier for people to take courses, but I uh, 
certainly am here. So that's it. All right. Thank you, Rick. Mike. Put this hand down. I uh, I actually don't. I'm, I'm trying to come up with how it's a barrier. Uh, it was two 30 hour classes now and they're having to take those combined to, to reach the 60 hours. Uh, we're not asking for more hours and I wasn't part of the, the working group, but I am in agreement with what they proposed. Uh, it's the same amount of hours. Um, it's just put forward and it's put into one class. If anything, we've this would limit it down to one exam versus two. Um, and I would think would streamline that process and make it easier versus more difficult because we're not actually asking for more with this recommendation. It's just two of them combined into one as and making it a prerequisite um, for the consumer. I see it being easier and more palatable. Um, I can see for the uh, education providers like many of us in the room. Change in processes would have to come into play, but definitely not more difficult for the consumer. OK, I think this is a good time to look at Monty Ball's comment, which definitely hits both agenda item eight and nine, but focusing on number eight. So if we could bring his comment up. Um, and has everybody had a chance to read it or do we need to read it to the group? I have another question for the group. Um, so you, the working group feels like if you combine principles one and two, it should also be taken ahead of any other courses. That there is no, um, it is, it would not be good for them to take, to combine principles one and two, but depending on what's available and how schedule allows to take another, let's say, you know, law of agency ahead of principles one and two. Is that correct? You're saying combine them and take it ahead of any other course. That is that is what the working groups are recommending. Uh, and that we, we feel strongly that there needs to be a foundation before we get into the other courses. Thank you. All, all right, okay. any comments on Monte? Go ahead. I have one more question, I'm sorry. Um, Jennifer and Vanessa, do you have any comments or thoughts or opinions on this? Yeah, I, I can um, speak to some of the things. I'll, I'll just echo what Vanessa said earlier that, you know, once this committee makes a recommendation, we would need to investigate feasibility um, and she knows a little more about the regulatory compliance and I know a little bit more about the database and it would definitely present a challenge um, in our current database. I, I think it might not be doable, um, but we may have the opportunity to address this with the database replacement system that's coming. So, and all I mean to say by that is that, you know, it may take some work. In, in order to do this. Um, but I think it's a, a really valuable conversation that you're having right now. Um, and then I wanna remind everybody, and this is in Lonnie's comment, that a 60 hour course would mean 120 hour, uh, 120 question final exam. Uh, that's based on how the rule is currently written for, you know, for our qualifying courses. So I think that's something, you know, to keep in mind as you're having this conversation. Um, definitely before at our last meeting, we talked about just kind of what, what can we do right now? And that is certainly to uh, send notices to education providers and in the meantime, recommend that they, that they recommend principles one and two before they take any other courses. So I think that's, you know, while while this is working itself through our system and the process and all of that, that's something we can do to help advocate for this initiative, which I think is is good. 
Um, there will be some challenges looking at uh, education for individuals who took education, you know, three years ago and now want to come in and apply and they didn't take principles one and two prior to the other courses. So again, it would just take some thought on on our end as to how we can, you know, work through the details of it. So Jen, can I ask a follow up question on the database system that Trek is working on? Is that a year or 18 months till we see that or is that 90 days to six months till we see that? Uh, closer to probably 12 to 15 months. Okay. Okay. And, and then the secondary question is we've had some great discussion. None of this happens overnight and Obviously, I would think the next step would be that if we wanted to move forward with this, that our recommendation would be to send it back to staff to figure out the logistical workings of it. Is that correct? Where do we go from here other than having the discussion and what we have done? So, yes, I, I like the idea of sending it to us to try and plug in, you know, like a real world plug in and figure out what the the boundaries are, some of which we have an idea, but um, I think we need a very clear recommendation. So is it that, you know, on item eight, do you want to adopt the recommended changes um, by the uh, adopt other, but do you want to recommend the changes as done by the um, working group? Do you want something on item nine about it, you know, the, the prerequisite component, the breaking it into two courses, the not breaking, or uh, sorry, putting it into one course, keeping it at two courses. If you can give us what your initial recommendations are as a formal recommendation from the group, we can take that and know exactly what it is you're trying to do. Right now, we've, we've preliminarily gone through a variety of options, but it's much easier when you've got the one recommendation. I understand. Kalia? I think I'm going to take a stab at a motion and we'll see how it goes. I'd like to move that we um, proceed with uh, asking staff to review the feasibility of the recommendations from the work group and include a recommendation uh, or analysis on the combination of the principles one and two as well as keeping them separate okay do i hear a second i'll second that motion all right we have a second any discussion um any discussion sure yes but the second part of your recommendation. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted. Go ahead. I just want to. I would uh, think they want. Yeah, I was ahead. just hoping that the staff could could help us along with determining if principles one and two combined into a 60 hour course is feasible versus keeping them separate oh, as wow. principles one and two, two 30 hour courses. Thank you. And, and I've seen a couple. Go ahead. Your recommendation, Kalia, just is not anything on the prerequ prerequisite portion. Just the combining. That's all. That's all we're talking about right now. No, no ma'am. I'm I'm talking about their their recommendations in their entirety that was provided in the materials. So eight and nine. We're talking eight and nine. Okay. Just want to make sure. We're yeah. Okay. All right. I've seen a couple hands go up. I assume it's in discussion to the motion in a second, Ruben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kalea is a very well-educated person and uh, we've been friends for a long time and I usually go along with what she says uh, because I, I respect her uh, from her experience. Um, but however, she kind of beat me to the motion. I wasn't ready to, to make a motion, but I was going to make a comment. One of the things that bothers me as an individual is being, let's say, a uh, volunteer or being assigned to a subcommittee or a task force to go out and have four, five, six meetings, come back with a recommendation, and then come back and say, oh, well, we're not going to go with what you guys said. We're going to take it back to staff and see what they want to do. We could have done that from the beginning and just had staff come up with a, 
uh, some ideas and then we could have all discussed it all at one time. Why waste everybody's time in Zoom meetings and phone calls and making sure everybody was there when well, we're going to just bring it back to staff? I would rather that we go in there uh, and just say we're going to go with the recommendations of the committee and leave it at that. Turn it in and then you guys do what you want to do with it. I don't work for the governor. I like the governor. I think he's a great guy. I'm not afraid to say how I feel, which is what I'm telling you right now. A lot of work went into this and a lot of great experience from some great people came back and said, here's our recommendation. You you go with it and do what you need to do with it now. And that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ruben. Rick? <clears throat> Muted. Rick, your hand was up and then it went down. But I have to unmute myself is the problem. Um, so I want to respond a little bit to Ruben's before my the reason for my hand going up. Uh, I think I think we are doing that, Ruben, and I, I understand your frustration because I've been on plenty of committees. But I, but you you set a blueprint down that the staff can work with now, um, and I don't know that they would have enough of a of guidance without it. And I, I think y'all have done a great job. Um, and it's the wheels of government grind slowly. <laughs> Just remember that. Um, so anyway, my, my the reason I had my hand up uh, is to ask Chuck uh, about this. What I guess is the second half of Kalea's motion. Um, and I'm going to preface it with if we've got a 60 hour course of, of one and two combined, that's more than a week's worth of classes. I mean, to Ooh. you've got 40 hours in a week. And I think uh, I still think it might be nice to break it up. So, Chuck, my question to you is, do we need to do principles one first before principles two? If it is broken up or does it make a difference? in your mind? I'm used to teaching this in a 90 hour format, not 60. <clears throat> and we certainly can cover it in a 90 hour format. Now, whether or not a private school can cram 60 hours of principles into seven days, you know, I think is, is a pretty tough requirement. Uh, if you say that there's going to be a 60 hour requirement, I think it simplifies things, at least in my mind, on putting the organization together. If you're going to say you should teach principles two instead of principles one, if you divide it up according to the format that the committee came, at, came back with, you'd be teaching License Act and fair housing laws in the first 30 hours. And that's tough for a student. Uh, those are very tough topics. And I think you need a whole lot of background before you get to those more complicated topics. Um, I'm teaching a class right now. And uh, all of my students are fourth year students at the University of Houston. So they're all seniors. Uh, and I can't commit them into license act violations and fair housing laws until we cover all the basics. So I think if you have to put one in front of two, okay. I mean, I, I can see how you might want to do that, but I would hate to start out with two. Two that got some very tough topics in it. And particularly when you get to fair housing. I spend my three hours of fair housing just confusing the ever-loving heck out of my students. <laughs> you know, you ask them what race means. And we, we've changed the definition of race so many times in the federal government that, you know, trying to give a 17-year-old student out of San Jack that kind of study material <laughs> in their first 30 hours, I think is kind of tough. I, th I think they need the seasoning before they get to the more difficult topics. So does that mean if it would be two courses, you would 
say do principles one first and principles two second. One's a prerequisite to two, and two's a prerequisite to any to all other courses. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. So I I just want to remind everybody we do have a motion and a second on the floor. So keep in, and I think all the comments have been made in reference to that. Mike, I see your hand up, but we're going to have to call for the vote soon. Mike. Uh, my comment in regards to the uh, agenda item eight, so I might have to postpone that. Uh, it was not specific to the motion. OK. Uh, we'll come back to that then in a second. I think we should call for the vote on the motion. Does anybody object to calling for the vote on it? Kalia, could you restate your motion? We've had a lot of discussion <laughs> since then. I just want to make sure we know what we're voting on. Me, you're going to ask me to do that. <laughs> um, OK, I would like to move that we ask staff to um, review the feasibility of the recommended um, recommendations from the working committee or the working group and the materials provided and include uh, the review of principles one and two as a combined 60 hour course as well as review it as principles one and two as two 30 hour courses okay with that being said all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed hearing none the motion passed so staff, I think you have your direction there. And Mike, I'll come back to your comment on agenda item eight. Uh, yes, and, and maybe this can help uh, with staff as they're going through it all. Uh, Monty Wall's comment, um, the one that really wasn't addressed yet was that last part about the final exam. We kind of briefed on it um, real fast staff. Um, how many questions is the current licensing exam? Oh, gosh, 110. That's the national, uh, and that's broker. Yeah, the, the state portion is 30, and then, yeah, I think you're right, the national portion is 80. Plus and so that puts us right at, if, if there were a, uh, a final exam for the end of a two hour, or sorry, a 60 hour course at 120, I think having a the longer comprehensive exam uh, actually does more justice in preparing these students for the national and state licensing exam. So not a, not only do I think it's not a concern, but I think it's a value add that they're getting a, a nice longer comprehensive exam before moving on to the, the topics of, uh, you know, real estate finance and, and agency, et cetera, to go more in depth. And so if we could consider that when we're looking at it, that uh, combining into one exam for those two uh, might actually be a benefit. All right, I'm going to move the floor to agenda item number nine. I think we've talked about it a lot with eight, but I want to make sure that we had any comments uh, that okay. needed to be said and that that. Yes, sorry, I'm, uh, can I ask one more question? So I just want to make sure everyone is cool with the outline as presented by the working group. You don't want to walk through it. Everyone read it and was like, wow, this is great. Okay. okay. Yes, so, ma'am. The motion. Well, that's the recommendation that we're going to look at it. Oh, I'm just making sure that we didn't, that, that nobody wanted to do a deeper dive. And that's cool. You know, I'm always cool with that. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, just, I just want to make sure that we got, we have all comments on a prerequisite on the floor. If anybody wanted to bring anything up on discussion and possible action regarding principles one and two as a prerequisite to other qualifying courses. I know we already took a vote and we included it in a motion, but I just want to make sure that if anybody wanted to talk about that specifically, they had the chance. I would mind Bill, if you don't mind. Can please do it, sir. Again, please. Yeah, please. Okay if you don't mind. That middle paragraph in here where 
and this might be the feasibility that you're talking about. Is this possible? But the questions in the middle of this paragraph, I'm concerned with that difficult for providers to enforce. If a student registers with a provider for the law of agency course, is it up to the provider to require proof that those uh, principles one and two were uh, completed if it comes from a different provider? So this might be some of the logistics that you're you're talking about. I mean, that jumped out at me. And that's a good question. Well, it jumped out at me as well, but if it's a prerequisite, then you don't get credit for it. And I mean, the license, once they're licensed, no one is walking them through the continuing education to say, well, you've got to take legal one and legal two. And I mean, it, they know what they have to take. They're not, you know, other than Trek sending them a notice saying, you know, remember to get your education if you're still doing that or not. Um, I, I think I think the it's up to the providers to let the the students know that they have prerequisites, but I don't know that the the providers need to police that. I do think that Trek needs to police it though. Even if the I, providers police it, I think Trek needs to police it. I shared the same concern with the with her uh, his note and in thinking through it, I think there will there will definitely have to be an effective date, a future effective date. Um, to help draw that line in the sand of when a prerequisite would then be required moving forward. And additionally, um, and Jen, check me if I'm wrong, but those course requirement certificates have a completion date on them. And so they would have, it would clearly show that they've taken their principal's course ahead of any of, of the other courses when they submit for approval at TREC. So I, I think it would have to be kind of like a, you know, effective January 125 or whenever that is, so that anybody that's kind of caught in that has has to know when they have to take those those prerequisites to submit for their application. Okay. Any other comments on that? This has been a good discussion today. Yeah. Is there any way in the current system? For the system to pull out when someone takes a class before another no. or to recognize okay. um, i think that's one of our handcuffs is waiting for the new system it it identifies completion dates in the system but there's not a trigger mechanism in place to like stop an application from proceeding you know we've tried to get things shifted into more automated and less manual, especially given the volume of license holders we have, the sales agents and the brokers, you know. Right. Um, so not in the current system. We can investigate it in the new system. To see if it works in the and new And that's, system. I think, what we would take from the recommendation that we heard, at least in my mind, I thought, okay, well, um, my team and Denise's team will get together with Acela, our new database, and just see what's what's feasible and bring that information back right. to you all. And, I mean, we can also put the requirements on the applicants, right? I mean, they have, but I think that's, that's similar to what you're saying of, um, you know, they need to know the requirements too, if those requirements are in place and get it done. Mm -hmm. I think the effect, I mean, it's quite, and, and you're right. Like once you have that line drawn in the sand, then you can move forward. But, you know, well, that's what we'll play with. We'll do some models to see if it works because mm -hmm. that's really hard right i mean otherwise you're doing it by hand with how many people per month Which we, can't, you know, we can't do that that's impossible to do. um and the other aspect that i would need to look into is that with the new system so right now our qualifying education providers can post um qualifying course credit directly into our database as long as the individual has a license number. So like it doesn't work right now for pre-licensing applicants, but it does work for SAE um, and anybody who's just completed a qualifying course that has a license. Um, with the new system, the intent is to have the education providers be able to upload in real time 
all qualifying education. So what we're working on in the back end is how we have that identifier for the applicant that, you know, um, so we would have to look at how that, how that could work with only accepting a principal's course initially right. and not anything else. Um, so yeah, it's a lot to explore, but, um, but you know, we're, our current system is, is really outdated and it was, it was high end at the time because there were very few licensing systems, but since that time, the technology has come a long way, and so we want to see absolutely everything that we can get out of out of this. Out of the new system. So we'll look into it. Um, yeah, we'll we'll take that lead. But I do want to also just kind of point out what what Vanessa said, and she asked about the the course approval forms, the the course content outlines that you did. So what we'll do, I guess, if this is what you all want is we'll go ahead and formalize those and put them in our our format that we have and bring them back to you and then as part of the other research that we're going to bring back is that right and then you can recommend them to the commission if you so choose yes. okay yes ma'am I, I, I would i would think that might be a possible agenda item for next meeting also i don't know if that's enough time for you to get that done yeah, perfect. We got it. All right, Mike, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I think it was uh, Vanessa that said, if you correct me if I'm wrong, um, putting putting the onus on the students to make sure they're taking their class in the right way. We already do that for folks that require the moral character determination. Um, it's you know, make sure you're able to get a license before you start all the education. Uh, it could be easily put in there that make sure you're taking these classes in order. It's added to the, the school's policies as a required item that, you know, students must be aware that they have to take these classes in a particular order, you know, with the prerequisite up front. Um, it's it's already being done in a sense for, for other things. Um, I, I don't think uh, Trek, they, they they might be able to have their system do something at some point where when it's entered in, it just rejects it. If for some reason it's the other one's not there first, but uh, uh, just to echo her comment, this is easily something we could explain to the students and say, this is what's required of you first. If you choose to do otherwise, you're just getting yourself some extra education. Uh, I like that. All right. Any other comments on this before we move the agenda? Hearing none, we're going to move to agenda item number 10, which is discussion regarding agenda items for the next meeting, which my assumption is staff will bring us back their their uh, review of principles one and two in the course so that that would indeed be an agenda item. What other agenda items will we have? All right. To start looking at another uh, pre licensing course. Started with principles one and two. We could bring an outline, the current outline for law of agency to you to initiate that conversation. Yeah, didn't we okay. decide we or, were going to look at them all again? Yeah. Yeah. So, would law of agency or law of contracts be better? <coughs> which, which makes sense. I know from an end user, there are very few people in the state of Texas that graduate law of contracts and know how to fill out a contract when they get in the field. With that said, in light of some industry dynamics, law of agency might be one to look That's at. True. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my recommendation would be law of agency at this time. Sounds good. Since it's, since it's fresh in all of our minds. <laughs> I would concur. That, and there's a, a large amount of questions on the uh, licensing exams that come out of agency. That'd be a good one to hit earlier. Okay. Then that would be perfect. We can add that one. What else should we add to the agenda? Okay. Vanessa, we don't need a recommendation or anything on possible agenda items, do we? No, we'll add them. 
Um, and then just think, here's what I think we want to think through if we're going to open up agency is the, and you can bring us to the next meeting, but um, to, you know, if, if we send out the outlines and you want to each individually kind of take your own stab at how you would do it, um, if you're going to want to go the working group route again, uh, just sort of that plan. You could do something where, you know, everybody provides their feedback. You get here, you look at it and you say, yeah, let's hammer it out in this meeting. Or why don't we take all of the, you know, all of the recommendations we have and, and push it to a working group since that was the way we went last time. Just those are things to think about so that, um, you know, being mindful of, of something that Ruben said, which I think, you know, was insightful of like, taking the action, doing the work in the meetings, getting something going. Um, I think that can that can be done with the, if you lead into this look at agency, either the way I just suggested of coming with your own recommendations and then doing it in the meeting or coming with your own recommendations, taking a look and being like, you know, ultimately it seems like a smaller group needs to address and then that's gonna push it out to another meeting, which is fine because these course revisions are not to be taken lightly, right? So just think about that. I think um, the, this next meeting will probably require some more um, prep work and looking at that course, because that is a really meaningful one. I mean, they're all meaningful, but I think that's one, you know, um, I say that now, I'm like, wait, did you all just say you want to do contracts first? Because equally as meaningful. Okay. <laughs> um, but something along those lines, um, just think about that as we, uh, you know, as we get closer to the next meeting, You'll have some different members, um, so some different perspectives. That should be good. I don't know who they are, but I know it will happen. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, I have one question towards that. How do we get in front of the new members, the different members, that we want them to actually review the course material and bring recommendations or their thoughts to the meeting? We can tell them that. Well, we, I usually encourage them to um, walk through the last few meetings beforehand, but we'll go ahead and let them know this is, you know, this is what this looks like, et cetera. So we can provide that guidance. Okay, perfect. Any other agenda items? Okay, then moving to agenda item number 11, we have set for our next meeting Monday, January 8th with an alternative of January 3rd or Thursday, January 4th. I'm, I for one hope we can keep Monday, January 8th, but what's the rest of the group feel on that? Yeah, I think we had said January 8th just to give everybody a breather after the new year. So I'm pro January 8th as well. Okay. I'm pro January 8th. All right, hearing no objection to that, are there any other comments before we move to adjourn the meeting? Vanessa, do we need a motion to adjourn the meeting? Oh gosh, this is the one I always... No, we don't. Just adjourn. But I always question. All right. You, you've Thank you all, all very much. Agenda. This was this was outstanding discussion. I wish I was in the room and not in Las Vegas, but great discussion. So thank you all very much. And we are adjourned. Happy holidays. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Yes. Happy holidays. Yes.